my very great um, privilege to welcome Nat Titman. We're very honored to have um, a talking. Um, Nat is notable for a number of reasons, um, one being the, um, the founder of the Asexuality Live Journal community um, back in 2002. This in fact even preceded the AVEN Asexuality Vis Asexual Visibility and Education Network by, um, well, it, it preceded the AVEN forums by um, a couple of months. Um, and that's also known for, for being heavily involved in writing the FAQ, the first FAQ on AVEN as well. Um, and Nat is more recently known for running the site practical and um, So it's my very great privilege to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you should probably be the one doing this. Okay, but anyway, I'd like to um, welcome Nat and um, I look forward to the first talk. Thank you. Um, but that changed at age 16, um, 
because I realised that while I didn't have sexual attraction, I, I was having romantic feelings for some people, and those romantic feelings were what society called queer. And identifying as queer made this huge difference to me, because this was a community uh, which was all about being different, being kind of off from the mainstream, but celebrating that as a positive thing, finding pride in your differences, which was at that point just the type of perspective I needed on life. Uh, when I was 17, I finally got access to the internet, uh, which was quite early, it was the 90s. Um, and I quickly found through uh, pre-Google search engines things like queer, transgender, and even some early genderqueer communities, but again, I struggled to find anything about people who didn't experience sexual attraction like me. Any attempt to kind of research this through out of vista site or Dogpile or any of those other <laughs> Yahoo directory tended to come up with stuff about impotence, sexual dysfunction, and celibacy, which is people intentionally choosing not to have sex. Uh, very little, though, about people who were able to enjoy sexual stimulation, but just didn't have the drive to share that with other people. Um, one of the reasons why there was so little out there was, and why that, what there was was so difficult to find was because asexuality wasn't really a defined thing. Unlike today, you didn't stumble across asexuals on every social website you visited. You certainly didn't hear about the orientation from your local LGBT group or your school sex education lessons, unless you were being taught about amoebas. <laughs> Everyone who was talking about being asexual back then had kind of essentially invented the concept of human asexuality. You'd have to have stumbled across this word, probably in your biology classes or some other context, and you'd have to have identified with this so strongly that you thought to apply it to yourself, and then not being put off when you entered this into a search engine and found absolutely nothing relevant. <laughs> I probably first heard about asexuality applied to a person through being involved with Doctor Who fandom online. Uh, in, in 97, the TV movie had just happened, and debates were still rife in the Doctor Who community over whether the Doctor kissing Grace Holloway was acceptable, given that they've been the first three years of the Doctor's history, and this had never been shown before. So, reading Rickhart's Doctor Who, I would come across people saying, my Doctor is asexual, all of the time. So this, this, was, this was probably where I first heard that. Uh, of course, most of those fans were talking about our kind of asexuality. If you look on the Doctor Who forum now, people are talking about the Doctor's romantic orientation. And what people were saying then was that he was an alien, and so he wasn't interested in these frivolous human things. In fact, the Doctor Who novels of that era explained how the Doctor's race reproduced without having sex. They were, they were weaved in looms. They didn't have the equipment. <laughs> so they didn't really mean our type of asexual there. That's no longer canon, I understand. Um, I'd also come across asexual being used to describe people in, in queer and genderqueer writing, uh, of which I'd read a lot of by that point. Um, descriptions of media portrayals of the type of gender norm conformity associated with queer communities tend to say how the, me the, the media portrayals would kind of desexualize people. They would kind of take communities that were, you know, Things like drag queens, which are in the wild, but dra drag queens tend to be quite sexual and be, it's all about satirizing sexual mores and, and, and for gender reasons as well, it, it varies. But in media portrayals, in 2 1 Fu, for example, it's just they just really lovely, cuddly people come along and help straight people have a good time. <laughs> and, uh, I most commonly remember this discussion of kind of desexualized androgynous people and drag queens associated with Boy George's 1980s public persona. He, he claims to prefer a cup of tea to having sex, which, you know, I can see that. But behind the scenes, we now know he was living a very different life. And uh, again, this was the word asexual often came up in this. They, they were talking about people, people being asexualized by the media. Um, Another notable androgynous person who was often associated with the world, and again had appeared in the media, uh, was, um, was a person called Toby, who in 1989 appeared on an American talk show called Sally Jesse Raphael. Um, Toby talked about being androgynous, non-sexual, and having an externally sexless body. Um, this appearance had made such an impact on audiences that people were still mixing up all of those concepts 
10 years later, to the point when, as an androgynous genderqueer person in the late 90s, people were often saying, oh, that's like Toby, so you're asexual as well, or you're this, that, and the other. And it was, it was something that androgynous people were constantly fighting against. This, if you're androgynous, you must be asexual or non-sexual or whatever the word people were using. Um, and looking through the, my email archive in, in um, preparation for this talk, because um, I have a huge amount of webmaster at Avon dot, uh, webmaster, webmaster at asexuality dot org emails from 2002, there's somebody um, asking about whether we, whether we could help them track down Toby, because they'd seen this and it had stuck with them, and they'd Googled for asexual, thinking that's what Toby was, and found Avon. Um, it wasn't, wasn't actually that surprising. I don't believe Toby ever referred to them herself or this as himself as asexual. They called themselves neuter. Um, but the literature, there's a number of books that talked about Toby and said this is an asexual person. There's even a case study in a book called Sexuality Now, Embracing Diversity. Oh, I've forgotten to do the thingy again. Okay. I'll just scroll past. <laughs> I, I should have remembered. I never did this in my practice. Very well. <laughs> this is this is the book. Um, this is the book. Sexuality Now: Embracing Diversity, published. I think this is the 2007 edition. Yes, it is. Because in the corner now it says asexuality. Top left corner it says asexuality often refers to the lack of sexual desire which the previous edition did not say. So this is talking about the concept of asexualism being a gender category, literally meaning lack of maleness or femaleness. And thankfully, due to Avon's work, and I'm pretty sure it is because of Avon, because in the third edition that came a year after this, it's full of references to Avon. It, even, it, it, it has like a case study that's just about Avon. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is in the book anymore, I assume, because they decided it was confusing. So this is, this is an example of of an academic using the word asexual to mean something we wouldn't identify at all, talking about asexual as a kind of like transsexual rather than or in, intersex. It's it's not. You know, obviously, like, obviously, Toby wasn't wasn't he's an intersex person, but that's never mentioned in any of the literature. It's always asexual meter never never comes up. So, in the 1990s, if you were looking around and trying to find some description of an asexual person, you wouldn't be really talking about a lack of sexual attraction so much as somebody who is completely kind of neuter or, or completely, not only has no romance, no sexuality, possibly no gender at all, it was kind of a literally neuter thing um, and often confused with androgyny. Um, Things began to change in 2000. I can't remember what my slides are. Uh, this is, this is um, yeah. Um, things began to change in 2000, though, as people who had claimed the label asexual for themselves started to find each other and talk about their shared identity on the internet. And I'm inclined to pin this development on the rise of the superior Google search engine. The earliest article that I recall claiming, claiming and defining asexual in a way that I recognised being our definition, was a, um, an article written in 2007 by Zoe O'Reilly called My Life as an Amoeba, um, which is a really, really good article, and it's, it's talking about it in terms of coming out, related to Ellen coming out that year. And that is, you read that now, it's modern asexuality. It's, it's really, really good stuff. And it has a comment section that you might reasonably call the first asexual discussion community because it's just full of people who suddenly found this article going, other people are like me, and talking to me. It's got page-long comments that are people just giving their entire life story. And um, if you look at the dates on the comments, actually, they're not dated on there. If you use archive.org to look at the dates of the comments and when they came in, to 1997, you get a handful, and they're mostly from people that already read this scene. Now, nothing in 1998. Suddenly, in late 99 and 2000, there's this massive explosion of comments. And that's, that's exactly when Google went into the mainstream and people started using it. Google actually worked. If you put concepts into there, 
if you, it wouldn't have found asexual, but if you put human asexual, you'd have got this article. And that's why people suddenly started finding each other. So we can thank Google for the, the very beginnings. And, and this, was, this was very influential. I mean, it was really common in the early community to have these cutesy references to being amoebas. And um, it's very likely this, this um, inspired the Haven for the Human Amoeba Yahoo group. Because, um, one, it's got Amoeba in the title, and two, one of the really earliest posts by the founder links to Zoe's article. It doesn't say anything other than, I found this and it's interesting, but I think we can, we can possibly make that connection. Um, didn't actually consider asking the founder anything. Oh well. Um, I would argue that maybe these reactions, these, these, um, Amoeba things are because people who identify with this word just constantly found references to biology. And it was, it was often a kind of common insult that we got from people, from kind of sarcastic people would go, you, you people don't understand biology at all. <laughs> so it, in a way it's kind of hanging a lantern on that idea that, that we don't, you know, that we're not recognised, that we're, that we're claiming this word, that, that people can look in a dictionary and say, look, the dictionary says you're wrong. We were, we were saying no, but we're human amoebas. Um, and um, I might be wrong, but I, I, I believe I was once told that Avon was almost called Haven, but yeah, that H true. stood for human amoeba, <laughs> uh, sorry, human asexual. <coughs> because again, to just differentiate it from this other type of asexuality that everyone believed. But didn't your, your friend or housemate? My, my housemate thought it was a bad idea. Yeah. Haven instead. Yeah. <laughs> Haven's like a, a holiday company. In the UK, so, um, so even by this point, we've had these small communities. You can see on there at this point, uh, which is 2002, there was like 136 members on here. So we had this small community. We had a label, human asexual, that we could find each other from. But even with that, there was still very little agreement about what being asexual meant. Rather than using the lens of sexual orientation to frame our experiences, most asexual mailing lists and discussion communities of that era had a, a very... It was basically the experience of not having sex. It was about people who didn't have sex. And they didn't have the language that we had today. There was no clear definition. And people, most of the messages that you get early on were people saying, am I allowed to call myself this? Somebody please give me permission. Um, so I, I think, um, uh, have I got the right slide, or oh, it's just, no I haven't, okay, well this, this is jumping ahead, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so at this time there seems to be three distinct varieties of people talking about identifying as asexual, and I'm simplifying here, they overlapped. Um, first there were these sites like um, Haven for Human Amoeba and Zoe's article that, um, the kind of support groups, uh, or just people saying, this thing exists, this is me, is anyone else like this? And p tending to get other people just going, yes, I'm like this, and then posting their entire life story. And they were, they were supported and celebratory, but they didn't really have a kind of, there was, they were weirdly directionless in what, in what they were talking about. The same sort of things came over and over again, and mostly it was just people saying, I'm also here, and I also identify with this thing. And I'm really glad people do too. Um, then there were the elitist exclusive to <coughs> asexuals who were really annoyed that these other people were using their word and are not getting it right. And some of these questions are, it probably doesn't show up here, but some of these questions would be quite offensive to, to asexual people today. They're asking you if you've been abused in childhood and if there's any reason why, what, what, what happened in your life to trigger your aversion to sex. Have you ever masturbated? Because if you answer yes to any of these questions, they, they didn't let you in. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, they were, the whole concept was that they were kind of trying to expose and keep out these insidious libidinists and solosexuals. It was kind of autosexual people coming into their pure sexual thing, talking about the dirty sexual feelings they had. How dare they? Um, and finally, there were anti-sexual communities. Again, as I said, these do overlap. But um, these were dominated by kind of angry critiques 
of the sexualized nature of society and all these cheap and meaningless sex that all these sexual people were having. Um, this, this was the um, community when I was trying to find asexual stuff on my journal. This was the community that came up. Again, I'll, I'll read that out because it's difficult to, 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 to see it. But, um, sorry, would you mind not talking? I'm not good at multitasking or like this. Or, um, so while there was, uh, sorry, what was I saying? Read yes, yes, I've got it. Um, while there's like perhaps this natural tendency for people to, who don't experience sexual attraction and aren't sexual people to resent quite how much sexual pressure there is in society. You know, especially when you're young, you're a teenager, everyone else is telling you to have sex and you know, pressuring you to stop being a virgin and you're not even experiencing sexual attraction and not sure you're interested in this at all. The, you know, the fact that every other advert you see is based on sex is a big factor. So I think it's quite natural for people to, to lash out and start criticizing everything around them as a kind of way to define their own identity. And especially when we didn't have this supportive asexual community around us, people tended to define themselves by what they weren't like and be judgmental. And um, so while that was natural, and while that happened, you know, that happens in Hayden, Human Amoeba, even the creator of the group is doing that by about 11 messages in. They're, they're criticizing the behavior of their, their, the people they live with and how they have all these relationships and they feel pressured. It's not, it's not the sort of thing I was looking for. So while that's natural and expected and something that the community kind of had to work our way through, we built our own community and started talking about ourselves rather than criticizing other people. This group, I'll read you the description here. This is a community for folks who think that sex is terribly overrated and pointless, unless, of course, it has meaning. <laughs> Come to think of it, there are tons of reasons why you might be asexual. Sex is constantly shoved down our throats by the media. What was once a beautiful and powerful thing is now cheapened because some brilliant demon possibly has started to use it to sell their product. Because of this, nobody takes it seriously. Sex is no longer about ex expressing anything. Fight back. <laughs> and, and, um, that, so that, that's an example of an early proto-asexual community. Um, it's basically a kind of um, angry celibacy. Uh, it's, got, it's got things like destroying social constructs and rebelling against the mainstream in its interests. Um, now, this is from a 2002-2004 website called asexuality.net that has an incredibly descriptivist approach to define what word asexual means from how people use it. I hope that's actually big enough for people to read. Now this is talking about how how this, this person's kind of gone, okay, I want to describe what asexual is, and rather than making my own definition of I'm going to summarize everything I've seen anyone using this word and put it up here. So they basically boil down to has a non-existent sex drive or a low sex drive, lacks sexual functions due to biological origins, or lacks sexual or romantic attraction to either gender. And there is um, <coughs> number three up there at the top says believes that sex and relationships are not in their best interests, um, which again implies a choice. Um, so I, I, I couldn't really feel at home in any of those groups. It was wonderful to know that those groups were there and to know that I wasn't the only one who was experiencing this and identifying so strongly with the word asexual. I didn't feel at home in them or really see myself in them. I did see myself as having a type of sexuality. I'd, I'd have romantic relationships as well. My, my, sexual, my sexuality just wasn't directed towards sexual attraction. I, I, it was an orientation thing. And I just didn't see anyone saying that at the time. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, while I'd had, I'd had a couple of romantic partners, I'd even had one partner who was really persuasive, and so I had, I had sex with them, and it was quite good fun, if not worth the fuss that everyone seemed to make about it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I certainly was never going to get into the official asexuality society. <laughs> Having had a, a, a moderately sexual active relationship in the past, and not, not you know, it, it was it was difficult. 
Um, I wasn't at all anti-sexual. In fact, at that point, I was uh, president of my university's LGBT society and coordinating a sexuality student health fund. Um, and I was regularly going to the UK bi, bi community events as well. So I was quite, you know, I was quite sex positive. I, and due to this background, I tended to see asexuality in terms of sexual orientation rather than non-sexuality or anti-sexuality or celibacy. To me, it's just another way to be queer. And I wouldn't want to see a queer group that decide, defined itself by criticizing the sexuality of others, or which imposed strict gatekeeping and policing on who got to call themselves queer. When I looked for organized queer communities, I wanted to see ones that told people that it was okay to be different, that celebrated this and welcomed them into the fold, and celebrated whatever they chose to do with their sexualities. And that was what I was looking for when I went online, when I went on to LiveJournal, which was where I was mainly socially active, and tried to find communities. And I was on brilliant communities for all sorts of things on there, but in fact, asexual is one. But what about destroying sex? Uh, <laughs> whereas, yeah, um, that group was just, it was, there was clearly people who were like me on there, but they were really, really struggling. And every time they post something, followed by a torrent of comments about how annoying the sexual people were. <laughs> and, um, so I went onto, onto a live and I created my own community called Asexuality. Uh, there's my version, and I'll just read what that says. This is a community for asexual people to discuss living without sexuality. We welcome anyone with no or very little sexual attraction to others. Those in romantic or emotional relationships who are wishing to discuss the issues involved in asexual relationships are welcome to bring their input to this forum, as are those asexuals who are comfortably single. Before you ask a question, you might, it might have already been answered in the FAQ, um, however, you're welcome to start discussions on similar topics. Please note that criticism of the sexuality of others is not permitted on this forum. This community was not created to attack the lifestyles of others, but to discuss the experience of being or living asexual. This community is not anti-sex or people who have sex. It is simply populated by people with little or no sexual drive on their own. And those who are those who sexualize is wishing to discuss abstinence and sexual activity, brackets celibacy, may wish to look at the asexuals community. Lots of people got sent to the asexuals community. <laughs> <laughs> and the interests on here are things like single living, romance, no sex drive, no sexuality, no sex drive, friendships. Love, tonic love, asexuality, it, it was very different from that other group. Um, this community quickly attracted a small but extremely enthusiastic group of members who were mostly lurkers on that other community, who even though it was an awful community that was incredibly negative and critical of sex, they sat there reading through this awful dirge all the time, <laughs> waiting to just see someone who might be a bit like them, a message. These people were all just coming up going, oh my god, you're here. Um, here's, my, here's my opening. I didn't have space for the comments, but the first one was just, wow, this place seems built for me. Um, and this is me again saying, I, I, personally, I'm sex positive. I think people should have as much or as little sex as they like with whoever they're attracted to. As long as sex is consensual, I think it's a positive, pleasurable thing, and that people should be allowed to enjoy it if they wish to. Sex doesn't have to have meaning if those involved decide it doesn't. I'm not against sex that is casual or trivial. It, that was an incredibly radical thing to say in an asexual community at that point. Um, it was quite a reactionary community, as you can see. It's clearly just references to that other community. It moved on and was very standalone, quite positive. We were trying to build a discussion by banning talking about sexual people's behaviours. We were inherently trying to talk constructively about what our behaviours were, what our identities mean, and kind of, kind of move on from there. And this was kind of a sea change. It wasn't just people saying, uh, yes, I also identify with this word, and I also don't have sex. I'm so glad, here's my life story. It moved on from that. Of course, that was still there. That was, that even now, that's a, that's a major thing. The welcoming area on Avon is it's a rite of passage, basically. But this was kind of the first sort of major move on that tries to kind of delineate things and say, I'm going to, while this other community is here, you can use it, and I'm going to point you there. Let's move on. Let's try and try and build something. So, um, a couple of mm, 
three or four weeks later, I was contacted by David J. over there. Here's his email. Um, I keep on my emails. <laughs> it's good for researching talks. Um, he created ABER, the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, and was in the process of moving this from his university hosting to the prime asexuality.org domain. I was really in favour of sensible domains that looked important. This, this was 2002. It was still common to have domains that had like tilde characters in and multiple levels of slashes before you actually got to. This was, this was big. It, you know, having, having that, we were like Amazon.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, did you have a similar background of looking, looking for a very sexual history, college LGBT societies and queer communities? And it hit on a very similar but catchier definition of asexual as a person who does not experience sexual attraction. Is is Asian site, which has an FAQ. It's basically an FAQ about what DJ's opinions are. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so what do you can you say this? It's like I personally can't say this. It's not actually about asexuality as much as you're just saying, I exist, here's my here are my theories. And you, you kind of existed in a bubble, really. Mm -hmm. um, the next slide has some of your theories that, obviously, like within 10 minutes of you meeting any other asexual people, you really yeah. didn't come. <laughs> um, so, um, for example, they, this, this is the, the original theory page, um, just a bit of it. The, this is where the logo came from. Um, it was like homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual as, as like the Kinsey scale, and then I guess because you didn't care about gender, you were single, yeah. and sexual people wouldn't. So there's a scale that goes for degree of sexual attraction that goes down to asexual at the bottom. And so the triangle is kind of saying that all asexual people are inherently um, pan, pan or romantic, or not romantic, pan, whatever. <laughs> and obviously, that's, 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 now just, that, that's not what it means anymore. It's just a symbol. Um, I just, so, yeah, um, this is the sort of thing that's on the site. I loved theory. I'm, I'm really into the theory side of things. I, I was at this point, I was on a mainly it's called Sphere, which was a genderqueer group that kind of talks about gender as being this kind of wibbly wobbly ball of gender rendering stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like, you know, everybody at that point talks about, um, talks about non-binary transgender stuff, it's like saying, here's a line, here's male, here's female, or here's masculine, here's feminine. And then in the middle is, is everyone else, which is ridiculous. <laughs> it's that saying like, so somewhere in the middle there's incredibly stone butch, um, there's incredibly stone butch women and incredibly feminine men, and they're just, they're exactly the same thing. <laughs> it doesn't really make any, any sense. So we were talking about gender as being this kind of, um, four-dimensional hypersphere of possible gender identities. We were, we were like this ridiculously kind of radical deconstruction of gender and saying like, there, there can be thousands of genders. There can be as many genders as people. Every person can have a million genders that constantly change. So we, it was a bit overkill in hindsight, but it was, it was really exciting at the time. So, so yes, my, we got talking through emails. We, we sent loads of emails back to each other. I am really feeling a bit I practiced in these emails. I sent you so much to read. <laughs> um, and I, I, critiqued, I critiqued this. And the next version on archive.org has a bit of a lot of of course, there are more than two genders. <laughs> um, but this, this is why we need to have a conversation about this. And this is what Avon is for. Um, uh, and yeah, but, so this, this concept which Avon had, which was a much simpler and catchier view, just said, Asexual means a person who does not experience sexual attraction and talks about it as an orientation and talks about it in terms, in the same terms that LGBT groups use, but LGB especially, um, use to describe that. That is incredibly catchy. People understood that concept and that, that I, was so, I was so excited by the idea. Um, and I found this kind of synchronicity that we both come up with the same thing for similar reasons, incredibly exciting and inspiring. I've poured over everything on this website. I sent ridiculous amounts of stuff. <laughs> and we had lengthy stuff. And eventually, I, um, Carl volunteered, you have offered, and I wrote the FAQ. Um, you know, we were, you were much less reactionary than I was. I was kind of rebelling against this awful community on my journey, making this different one, but making this massive I, thing about being sex positive. You were sex neutral, 
which you know, to me that's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, but yes, much less reactionary. Um, I got to critique your stuff and we built and we kind of had these ideas and then this kind of moved on to you know you invited me onto the forums and then we had you know for the first four or five months on the forums it's just there's this one bit of the forums where we're just coming up with all these exciting ideas um, and um, the forums came with the I think they came with the hosting for asexuality.org it was almost an accident we just got them for free with the hosting <laughs> so there they were I think I'm user number 15 on the forums, and when you, you're on your email, you're saying, I've just created the forums. You're basically saying, I'm emailing everybody I can find on Google, just make sure you're section. Please join my forum. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't know what you expected, but I sent you back like, this massive outpouring. Here's all my theories. Wow. Um, cool. So I started writing this FAQ. FAQs were really important to me. I was really into theory. I found myself in all sorts of things. When I first got onto the internet in '97, I found the androgyny RAQ, that's rarely asked questions, very funny. Um, and that had been such a revelation to me. I'd seen myself in that so much. And um, so I was really into writing really good materials that people could read. People who didn't like going onto forums and talking to people could just kind of pour over these and it would answer their questions. And I've been on the forums for a while, I've been on all these mailing lists I've learnt, I've been on, on that awful asexual community, my asexual community, and um, <clears throat> I kind of sat down to write all this frequently, what was genuinely the frequently asked questions, and then a bunch of other stuff that I thought were the questions that people were too afraid to ask, the, the, the kind of taboo making, breaking questions. Um, when I was looking through my email archive in preparation for this, the summer of 2002 when I was writing this, it went up in August, I think. Throughout the summer, I, I got loads of people to proofread. A whole, out of DJ proofreads, um, some of my friends proofread, but mainly it's other genderqueer people who are proofreading this. And it reads like cheerleading to, <laughs> to my affirmative tone that I'm lacing through that. I kind of look at it now, and it's almost like a secret manifesto for <laughs> positive asexuality. And, and not, and it was, again, in, in major reaction to this official asexuality society that was, being, it was trying to compete with Avon. And they were competing so that you had to pass this offensive test that asked you these awful questions. We were saying, come in, come in, you can identify. Me. Yes. Like, everyone would come in and say, am I allowed to be asexual? And we say, only you can answer that question, but we love you and what you are here and Whereas the official asexuality is like, it's like, am, am I allowed to call myself asexual? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a survey. Have you, have you ever touched your genitals? <laughs> 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 Have sex? Did you like it? Well, I'm afraid even though you didn't like it, we're still not there anyway. Because you should just know. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things that really struck me when I was looking through the email, one of the, in one of the emails, DJ says, "Can we include this question saying is it on there? Um, it's one here on the next one. There's a question saying, I have sex." with my sexual partner. I'm asexual but I have sex. And, 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 and can I call myself asexual? And I say, asexual, it's just an orientation. Asexual people can have sex and enjoy having sex. It doesn't have to invalidate your identity. And DJ says, we can't say this. Nobody's ever said that. I don't know anybody who's ever said that. And I say, well, I know somebody. I don't even have, I don't even have sex to bring it through and say to me, because I'm worried that I'd be thrown out. <laughs> And I think it was partly self-imposed, but that, that's, that's the difference between now. And I think it's fantastic that our article in Metro actually includes the, number, the percentage of asexual people who are sexually active and the percentage who enjoy having sex. That is so fantastic to me as someone who, last time I was active in the community, I was purposefully not talking about that side of myself. It was in the past which made it easier, but still. Um, and now, none of this stuff is really that revolutionary. It seems I like have a, like a kid going on. <laughs> 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 today, 
we accept that asexuality is an orientation. This is not radical. At the time, this is kind of, you know, this has got, this has got questions saying, I have a fetish, am I allowed to be called asexual? And he says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are things that no one was talking about, but I just, I just like went through it systematically, put all this stuff in here. And it's got, is asexuality inherently queer? Uh, are, asexuality pe are asexual people more sensible and clever? We're better than asexual people because they're so distracting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's all in there. It's not very well written. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> but it's there. Um, so unsurprisingly, as I said, Avon's positive, inclusive, welcoming tone is catchy and easily understandable orientation definition, and it's a forested looking domain name with good search engine optimization. Men that, and it's authoritative about putting the word official in it, which it's the official asexual society. I'm not, I'm not sure who, who accredited that one. Um, that all contributed to making the site gradually win out over all these other competing. Uh, forums and for a while, Avon was basically all there was. The asexual community went on because they, they, sorry, the live journal community went on because live journal had its own its own kind of ethos, and people on there were talking their live journal identities, their pseudonyms. Um, but within, um, um, sorry, just interrupting. I'm, I'm sorry about the music. We can't sort of do anything about it. And this is entirely my stupidity for not putting it out. But there is actually a microphone, um, which will help. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, I'm sorry about this. Is there a microphone stand? No. You can send it, you can leave it like that, but it's really stone first. You can put it close to your mouth. Yeah, I mean, it's good. I can't hold something like that, but I've got it. I've got it. Can I just make a suggestion about that? We actually invite them to join us in here if they don't want to, to voluntarily turn it down. Um, 
I read through my version of preparation for this talk, and I was surprised to find advice in there that I thought I'd learned through hard life experience over the last 10 years. That um, apparently I'd idealistically speculated about these sorts of things and kind of written advice that would have been really helpful for myself to understand. <laughs> Um, from Avon's um, Raven's beginnings, where DJ ran the discussion community, I female forwarded that. I fielded emails in response to the FAQ and both received messages to the webmaster. The community grew and grew and soon became self sustaining. The community is now truly de democratic, with not only elected forum moderators, but an elected project team dedicated to promoting asexual history and education, creating materials. <coughs> and updating existing materials, organizing events such as this <coughs> People come and go. People do what they can, bring what they can, bring their passion to the asexual movement. And I'm honored to have been one of the first in a long line of volunteers that have made this movement what it is. Um, I gradually moved, um, here's what I do now. I gradually moved away from Avon's activism uh, in, the mid, in the mid 2000s. And this was because of, the focus became more on even stated goal of visibility and education. And at that time, I felt that as an androgynously presenting gender queer non binary transgender person with, transgender, with transsexual medical history, I probably wasn't the best host. I thought I might confuse things. Um, so I stepped back and allowed others to appear in the, in the, in the media, in newspaper articles, and talk shows, and in documentary films. Uh, um, I ended up in another romantic relationship with another persuasive partner and I still felt that made me feel less comfortable about being involved in the community. And I'm really glad that that's not so much of a problem nowadays. You know, I've now been, um, I wouldn't say I'm single, I'd say I'm an emotionally self-sufficient standalone person with no romance drive. <laughs> it means it. Um, it has different connotations. And that's how I, how I remain for these day, to this day. Um, I think what's happened now is that... Um, da, da, da. Coming back to Avon after five years of being away, and um, it was weird. It felt like I'd, I was revisiting in a strange community. It's like having coffee with an old flame. It, was, it made me realize how many of the things that I love are associated with fandoms or communities of people that I share a common passion with. And I think in a way communities like ours are another form of shared intimacy that complements friendships and partnerships. Um, I'm, I've been asked to reflect on how the community has changed. I'm going to do this a lot more quickly than I was going to because this has gone, I didn't do the slides. So um, I think we've broken the taboos. We don't have to, there are still taboos, and we're still working on breaking those taboos. But I think the fact that we now have YouTube and can represent ourselves, we're not relying on the media, and we're not relying on just one FAQ, it's a more democratic process. We can represent ourselves, and we can talk about all these sorts of things that are diverse things. And I don't think that there's the same kind of self-imposed, and you know, imposed by, by entrance examinations types of restrictions that we have now. Um, da, 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 the end. <laughs> um, I was really pleased to see the um, discussions on the microphones of the of the um, unassailable and gold star section. <coughs> I can talk about myself, the fact that I have this intersectional identity. I can't pick apart the fact that I have, I'm, I'm agender, that I, I'm androgynous, that I I have transsexual medical history, that I have autistic spectrum traits. I can't pick those apart, and I, but I can talk now in this wider community of all these people and not worry that people are going to assume that any of those things mean that everybody is the same. You can have the, these sorts of experiences, and I think that's really important that we're talking about with these intersections now. Um, skipping ahead, skipping ahead. <laughs> um, I think the main difference is size. There are all these communities now, there's offshoot communities now, there's, there's competing voices, there's complementary voices, there's multilingual and international voices, this, this is a massive difference. And there's in-person meetings. I, I, have, I have local meetups, I, there's meetups in my city, there's meetups in Birmingham, there's just one across. I never imagined that 10 years ago. I never imagined marching with a asexuals and pride. I would never have even conceived that I could be speaking at this conference. Um, 
some bright pictures. I, I should have included who took these pictures, I forgot. So, so sorry about that. Um, in the decades since the modern asexual community was founded, asexuality has become well known and widespread, at least in the types of communities I frequent. And I still find myself surprised by and so pleased whenever I come across asexuality, vision, and inclusion, and unexpected and unrelated places and materials that I don't think communities had anything to do with. Aiden can be proud to have achieved so much towards its goals of his beauty and education. And I'm really excited to see what the asexual movement will achieve in the decades to come. Thank you for listening.